Today, I'm talking to you about the importance of pH in homebrew. So there are many different chemical and physical properties in homebrew that affect fermentation and affect your final outcome. And pH is one of those things. So today, we're going to focus on pH, go in about the different values of pH, what inherent values different ingredients have on the pH and how to make things higher or lower in pH. To start off with, we're gonna talk about primary fermentation. Now, the act of fermentation uses a biological agent and that is yeast. And like all living organisms, yeast prefer a particular environment so that they can thrive and produce and do the things that we want them to do, which is to make alcohol. So if we don't have the correct environment for them, they're not going to be doing what we want them to do as readily. They might even die or stop doing what we want them to do. So pH is one of those things that really affects their ability to produce for us. Ideally, yeast cells can tolerate a pH of four to 8.5. But if we narrow those parameters slightly more, they work best at a range of four to six. Now this is gonna vary greatly depending on the type of yeast you're working with and what type of brewing you're doing. For example, certain yeasts and beer brewing techniques have a much more stricter pH range. So you need to, uh, get some knowledge in there and make sure you're following the proper guidelines for what you're intending to brew. Now, if those numbers really don't mean much to you, which when I started out in this hobby, they really didn't mean much to me, let me give you some parameters so that way it makes a little bit more sense. Let's start off with pure water. Pure water is considered a neutral pH and that is of seven. So you just have water, it's a seven pH that is neutral. That means it's not acidic and it's not basic or alkaline. It's just right in the middle. So anything lower than that neutral or seven is gonna be considered acidic. Anything higher than that seven is gonna be considered basic or alkaline. So let's take a look at some other ingredients that we may typically use in home brewing and what their pH levels naturally are. Okay, so now that we have that information available to us, we can use a simple pH reader and test our must before adding our yeast to make sure that we're in the right range. If we're using things in our brew that we know are highly acidic, then we might want to make it not so acidic so that our yeast can reproduce. Uh, opposite of that, if we're using ingredients that are highly basic, we may want to bump the acid levels so that way we're again in a range that our yeasts are going to want to be able to do their job. So how do we adjust the pH in our brews? That's a good question and that's what I'm going to go over right now. Acid blends such as Malic, citric, and tartanic acids are used to chemically increase the acidic levels, as the acid blend name indicates. You can also use simple ingredients that you may have around your house, such as lemon juice, lemon peel, or any citric peel is going to have the essential oils of citrus that are going to be acidic. These may help change your pH in your must making it a better environment for your yeast. Some of these things take time to extract, so you want to take that into consideration. If you need to have an immediate change on your pH, then using an acid blend or an acidic element such as lemon juice may be the way to go. Alternatively, calcium carbonate is used to deacidified chemically, but should only be used for minor adjustments as it can create some off flavors or some other not ideal situations that may alter your brew in a way you're not looking for it to be altered. A better option for adjusting both is to make sure you start with a must in the proper pH for your yeast to ferment 
and then add any of those elements after fermentation is complete that may cause for a really high acid level or a really strong base or alkaline level. That way you have the ideal situation for your fermentation, but you still get those flavoring components in there without worrying about stressing your yeast. Now that was all just the pH things that you need to consider during primary fermentation, because that's when you're working strongly side by side with those yeasts. Without those yeasts, nothing's gonna ferment. So we wanna make sure that they are happy. Now, once fermentation is complete, we don't have to worry about the yeast so much anymore, but there's other things to take into consideration. For example, many winemakers will want to adjust the pH after fermentation is complete to instill a, a more stable end product. This can aid in the longevity of wine. And as you know, many wines are better received after an extended period of aging over multiple, multiple years. Lower pH values are known to improve stability. And so many winemakers will purposefully lower the pH after fermentation is done. Thus, winemakers usually prefer a pH range of 3 to 3.5 as their final product for that ideal stability range. So you can tell that this is certainly below the low range for fermentation of 4. So what they do after fermentation is complete is they add more acidic elements to their wine to lower the pH. This can be done again through the things we've covered already, or if they have a flavor component that they want to add to their wine they, that they know is acidic, then they can add it after fermentation, as I already discussed, get to the proper stability range and the flavor profile that they were looking for originally. Of course, there is much more information that can be gathered about the importance of pH in home brewing, but I felt that this was really important to share with you so you can get a better understanding of the different ingredients that we're using in our brews and how they affect the pH and how it's important to know what pH range you want during primary fermentation and what pH may be better for you for long-term storage. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time on CSB.